Uh, my name is Addy, Addy Rao. I'm first year uh, common law. Uh, my question is for uh, Mr. Robert Walsh. Uh, and it's, uh, so just sort of drawing from current events is, and drawing from what you've just been talking about, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the relationship between uh, members of parliament and uh, the judiciary in the sense that, uh, let's take Dean Del Mastro, who was quoted after having been convicted as saying about the judge that, well, it's just his opinion, I'm gonna go appeal. Uh, and then now, today we're seeing um, the Minister for uh, Immigration, uh, Minister Alexander, trying to deal with the, the recent order to, to reinstate refugee healthcare. And over the past few hours, we've been seeing the changes or the, or the reversion to what it used to be sort of roll out. But the problem is, uh, the minister sort of is kind of uh, bringing those changes back in in a way that may not necessarily actually amount to reinstating what previously existed, but just sort of you know putting in what he feels like might, might you know fly uh, in the meanwhile, and, and has said that he's also going to go ahead and appeal. So the, so the question I have is sort of this relationship between uh, a judge's ruling and and uh, and parliamentarians. Um, do you have any thoughts on it? The, the, um, the constitutional expert, uh, Peter Hogg, developed a notion of a dialogue between the courts and parliament that uh, the, the, the idea was that the courts would make a ruling. Well, that's their, their intervention on the issue. And now parliament can consider the issue and look at what the court ruled and perhaps come to a different conclusion and legislate accordingly and then that may end up back in the court, and the court will have its uh, response uh, if it's given an occasion to have one, and so on, and this dialogue goes forward. But more specifically, and, and you mentioned the Del Mastro matter just now, and you mentioned another case with which I'm not familiar, but generally speaking, it's open to the House to, or the government, to bring in proposals for legislation that may be designed to, in some manner, uh, get around a ruling of the court, or, or in effect nullify a ruling of the court. I mean. You know, the courts make their rulings, fine, and then Parliament, and particularly the House of Commons, has the option to legislate as it sees fit and run the risk that it may get nowhere because it may end up getting rejected later once again in the court, but it's perfectly understandable they could do that. And Mr. Del Mastro's comment about the judge, well, that's her opinion, well, you know, what can I say? Thanks. Hello, uh, my name's Angela Arnett Canitas. I was a former law student here, and I was also a former employee of the Department of Justice when Mr. Kotler was our minister. Um, I don't know if I have the perfectly framed question, but it will be short, and it's for Mr. Kotler. Um, what place do you see um, in the rule of law for the continuing use of the royal prerogative of mercy, which is in the criminal code? That's, that wasn't one of his seven principles, so he's got no, to think no, about no, no, it. No, well, it, it, one of the things that uh, I did uh, en end up engaging in, um, which is, if you will, not so much mercy, but uh, it is mercy in, in its consequence, but it's more an issue of justice, and that had to do with uh, wrongful convictions. Uh, again, this is something that I did not anticipate before I became uh, Minister of Justice, you know, uh, I learned uh, about the Truscott case as a law student as a case of capital punishment. Uh, we never learned about it as a case of uh, wrongful uh, conviction. Uh, then afterwards, the power was vested in the uh, Minister of Justice that where there was uh, prima facie uh, evidence of a miscarriage of justice, then the uh, Minister of, of Justice uh, had the uh, authority at that point uh, to either quash the con uh, <coughs> uh, the uh, conviction and uh, well it was two things one was he could send it to the quash the, the conviction and order a new trial or send it to uh, the court of appeal for a fresh hearing on the merits now in the Trescott case I knew that if I quashed the conviction, there would be no new trial because the Attorney General of Ontario had said uh, that he would not proceed. Uh, so I then went to the next uh, option, which was to, uh, in fact, uh, 
refer the matter to the Ontario Court of Appeal for a fresh hearing on the merits, uh, which is what then ensued, and uh, Trescott was, as a result of, of that uh, hearing, um, acquitted. The question of mercy was not something that ever mm -hmm. arose. The only way these issues arose for me were issues in terms of uh, wrongful uh, conviction. So I would have to take a look again at the royal prerogative of mercy because never the issue did not arise while I was there on that point. Thank you. Hi, my question is probably best suited for uh, Mr. Walsh or Mr. Kotler. My name is Reem. I'm a third year law student here at the University of Ottawa. I've been sort of perplexed by the interplay between judicial discretion and the royal prerogative and how the two clash. Lately, we've seen a lot of, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't use the term fettering, but perhaps uh, crossing into the Rubicon of judicial discretion through legislative authority, through amendments to the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act, particularly uh, the Citizenship Act, with respect to how judicial review is arranged and how judicial review is allotted and, and limited. So my question to either Mr. Collar or Mr. Walsh is, how are we to deal as future attorneys and as attorneys in this room today with that clash between judicial discretion or with that, that encroachment, so to speak? Is it an encroachment in and of itself on the separation of powers between the executive and the judiciary? Uh, is it something that we need to flag as, uh, as an issue going forward, uh, perhaps not just in, in the context of immigration and refugee law, but uh, in other contexts where judicial review is, uh, is limited or judicial discretion is limited? Actually, before you answer that question, I'm going to ask my colleague uh, Jennifer Bond to also ask the questions because I highly suspect that her question is actually going to be on the same wavelength. So, um, and perhaps the entire panel can answer the, these questions because I think David, you also have a role to play in answering the, this, the first question too. Uh, thank you. Actually, um, I hate to bring up immigration and refugee law again, but it is uh, a day, as uh, Addy mentioned, where it's on the minds of many of us because uh, we've attempted, and by we, I, I speak on behalf of the um, advocacy community uh, who's working um, to deal with refugee health cuts, to deal with the court process as a mechanism of um, engaging the rule of law. Uh, we were successful in court. Um, we were successful uh, in defeating a stay application. And today at midnight is the deadline for the government to restore um, health care to all categories of refugee claimants in this country pending the outcome of an appeal. And I was actually going to address my question to Natalie, but I certainly uh, welcome mm -hmm. reflections from any of the panelists. Um, we have since heard from the minister just within the last few hours that they will not be complying with the order of the court. Um, uh, and subsequently from their failed stay application, they will be partially restoring uh, refugee health benefits, but not fully restoring them. So I guess my question is, in, in a time when we're attempting to use more traditional legal mechanisms to enforce uh, constraints on power, uh, given the responses that we're seeing, do you have any reflections on how the rule of law might be enforced outside the courtroom and, and what, that might, what that might look like? And I certainly welcome comments by any of the panelists, but, I, but I'm in particularly interested in Natalie's comment. Thank you, Jennifer. Well, I think uh, uh, the rule of law says if we have a dialogue, it cannot become a monologue. So uh, in a way, but the price will be political. That's why I thought, you know, you cannot, you have to also give the indifferent and the civil society the, uh, the power to say, that's wrong. You know, uh, you know it's, we, we cannot have uh, disregard for uh, uh, the rule of law and disregard for a judge's opinion. And, you know, we'll see uh, how they finesse this. And, you know, let's hear about tomorrow morning how they, how they manage this. But I think uh, fundamentally that's about this. Uh, all society should care. Uh, if it's wrong, then find the proper processes. If you think it's wrong, find the pro pro proper processes to, to debate this. But to say, well, you know, uh, it's just an opinion. And, but it's, a, it's the, so I, I think that's, that's the core, you know, is to, to ensure that within the government, within 
uh, uh, general people. People are, are, say it's a high price to pay to disregard the rule of law, and it's incumbent on all of us to make that voice heard. It's ironic that government is, is performing civil disobedience, but anyway. Mm -hmm. um, Owen? I, I just uh, to connect to something that Natalie said before and, and now in the questions, you know, but the whole issue of, of, of access uh, to justice and relating to uh, disadvantaged groups and refugees uh, being um, amongst them, it, it goes right back really to, to priorities and, and, and principles. How does a government frame its priorities and principles? And uh, you know, one of them that I did not have a chance to mention and amongst the seven, but it relates in this way both to and Natalie's views and the comments. And that is, I, one of the principles that we try to establish as a government that the test of a just society is how does the government treat the, the disadvantaged amongst it? How does it treat its most vulnerable? Whether it be uh, children, the most vulnerable, the vulnerable, whether it be uh, women violated women, whether it be uh, refugees, whether it be aboriginals, etc. And we sought to have this notion and certainly as Minister of Justice for me, this was a, a Grundnorm uh, principle. And uh, w on all these issues, on the matter of children, uh, the first piece of legislation I introduced was protection of children and other vulnerable persons. In the matter of women, the first piece of legislation I introduced was with regard to trafficking in, in persons. With regard to refugees, uh, <coughs> I worked together with uh, two uh, uh, ministers of, of uh, immigration where our approach was how can we protect refugees and how can we grant them the proper access under the law uh, to the uh, <coughs> benefits and services, et cetera, than we felt uh, refugees would be in, entitled to. And uh, as I say, there are two ways to approach it. You can approach the whole question of, of refugees and say we're going to designate countries as safe countries. There are no refugees from that country. Or you can go ahead and designate certain places as being refugee producing countries and therefore uh, have a predisposition for getting, uh, conferring refugee status and then the services that follow. And the same thing with, with the Aboriginal. So uh, for me it came back to what is the government's priorities, what is its governing philosophy in its relationship to the people, to the institutions of government, how does it relate to parliament, how does it relate to the courts, how does it relate to civil uh, society. All that comes together, and in all these questions, uh, you can see a distinguishable approach between the present government and the previous government or other governments in a manner in which they would relate to all the institutions of governance, including civil society. Thank you. And last, uh, Rob? I do think, though, that if going back to judicial discretion and legislative initiatives to try and uh, limit that discretion, well, legislation can define the terms of any uh, uh, right or entitlement under the legislation, and that, and that can have the effect of, of constraining the courts in its uh, application of the statute. But, of course, it runs up against, ultimately, the provisions of the Constitution, in particular the Charter, and if the legislation is trying to somehow deny the exercise of judicial discretion uh, relative to the Charter, well, it won't work, um, because the Charter is constitutional, and these, these legislative pieces of legislation are just... Uh, just that ordinary legislation. I'd like to thank our distinguished panel for doing a great job here.